My name's Scott Wilson and I'm the Service Manager at OSS Watch. Uh, my name's Mark Johnson and I'm Development Manager for OSWatch. Open source software, as we define it, is software that's been licensed according to um, the guidelines of the Open Source Initiative. And the Open Source Initiative agrees a number of uh, licenses that can be used, such as uh, there's the GPL, there's the Apache Software Licence, and so on. And that's what the, uh, the definition of open source. Often, though, what we really talk about is open development, which is projects that are run in a way that allows people from around the world to contribute and to improve those projects. Okay, so in open source, and also we use the term free software, now both of these terms are associated with different sets of conditions or permissions or freedoms. So free software is associated with the, the four freedoms, which determine um, what you can do with the software and who can use it. So there's things like uh, the, the freedom to distribute and reuse the software, to inspect it and change it, uh, to share what you've done with it with a wider community. So there are the freedoms that are basically enable software to have a community that continues to engage with it. Uh, the Open Source Initiative defines a set of uh, definitions of what open source is that are very similar in, in their um, intent, really. And they do things like, for example, describe that open source software should be able to be used by anyone, should discriminate against someone based on who they are or what their profession is or where they are in the world. So when we talk about open source and openness and freedom, these are the kinds of things that we mean. I think it's important to stress that although we couch these things in terms of freedom and openness, which seem like they might be kind of altruistic values, uh, that it's perfectly acceptable and perfectly normal within the world of open source and free software to focus on your own personal needs when it comes to contributing to a project. So the majority of people that engage in a source project will do so because it suits them. It, it does something for them. It's their personal uh, you know, drive to make this happen. So, for example, um, in many cases, people are inspired by the fact that they're a user of the software and there's something that they want to improve about it. Now, rather than just say, wouldn't it be nice if someone did something about it, in those cases, that person's gone and actually done it themselves. And because it's open source, they're able to do so. So in that case, it's someone's um, satisfying their own personal functional need to get the software working the way they want it to. Contributing to open source is actually a very effective way of developing your career as a person in the software industry, not just as a developer in any of the associated professions. Contributing to open source is one of the few ways where you can establish your presence in the field where you can develop experience that can be recognised by employers, by a wider industry. And so that when you're contributing to open source, everything you contribute is publicly visible. It can be inspected by companies that might be interested in what you can do. You, so you can exhibit that. It's very uh, grounded because often you're solving a real problem. And so it can be used as, as part of your career development. Yeah. Open source projects attract people with existing skills, including some of the most experienced developers in that area. So when you're engaged with this project, it's also a really good way of getting uh, advice and mentoring that maybe you wouldn't get elsewhere. And that's a good reason to contribute to some of the larger projects where you can interact on a, you know, a fairly kind of free way with people who've got a lot of experience in the field. Getting involved with an open source project is a good way of experiencing the reality of software development as it's practiced today. So, for example, most developers, when they're faced with a problem, often what they do is they go to the search engines and try and find an existing solution for it. Typically, it's things like you Google for the, you know, the errors that you're seeing on the screen or the, you know, the particular problem you're trying to solve and use that as a way of finding out what you've got to do next. There's very little, if you like, kind of, um, of knowing from first principle what the answer is to any computing problem and just coming out with it and writing it down the program and having a fantastic memory for every function. In practice, most people do a bit of collaboration online. And an open source project is very much, you see that, you know, that 
you're asking people for help all the time. It's a very much a collaborative environment in the sense that you're trying to solve a problem, you need help, you're doing something that is actually a benefit to others anyway, so there's a good reason for people to chip in and assist you in getting there. Uh, something that's, that's a really good opportunity for students is Google's Summer of Code and every year Google puts up uh, some money for students as kind of like a, for a summer project where they get involved with an existing uh, open source project. So that's another good you know, way of getting involved. So you look for the Google Summer of Code announcements, you identify a project to work with, you have to come up with a proposal for what problem you're going to solve for that project and then the project itself assigns a mentor and the mentor will basically take you through how you can do that contribution and assess how well you've done. Um, and students get funding for this, so there's a really good reason to do it, but also get a really good experience. An example of engaging with a project for your own reasons is, um, in some cases, because you depend on that project, you're a user of it, you, you have a stake in it continuing to work. So a while ago, there was a project that I made use of quite frequently called HTML Cleaner. And it does kind of what you expect it to do from the name, which is that it cleans up HTML and makes it more readable and usable in other programs. Now, I've noticed for a while that there hadn't been many new releases of this project. And that sort of worried me because I did depend on it quite a bit. And what I did was I checked out uh, who owned the project. So I got in touch uh, with the person who wrote this software and asked him what its status was. Now, although he's still very proud of the work he'd done and was trying to put some effort in where he could, he was working on other things, you know, he'd gone on to other work. And so what I did at that point was I asked him if he mind if I took over the project and continued it. And so what he did then was um, basically gave me the rights to uh, manage the project so that I could make releases and apply patches that members of the user community were submitting. And because of that, I, that piece of software is now much more viable and I can rely upon it again. Um, and other people are starting to take it up more now that they know that someone is there who's going to keep it maintained. Um, recently, I've been using uh, a project called BitTorrent Sync, which is a piece of software to give you a sort of self-hosted Dropbox-like solution where you can sync folders between multiple computers. Um, and it's available for several platforms, but um, on my Ubuntu desktop, it didn't have quite the same uh, user interface that it had on Windows and Mac. Uh, so basically I decided to solve my own problem by writing a little script which gave me an indicator on my desktop um, to show basically when I was shutting my computer down, is something still syncing, do I need to wait for a minute? So once I'd uh, written it and got it doing what I needed to do, I put it on GitHub, which is a, uh, a site for sharing uh, source code repositories. Um, I then found out that there was a guy who was packaging uh, BitTorrent Sync for various Linux distributions. So I got in touch with him um, and I asked him if he'd like to include my indicator in his packages, which would then mean that it would be definitely being used by more people. Um, and then once this happened, more people started using it, finding problems, finding problems with it on other systems, and they started sending me comments and contributing back to it. And I've now got a much more useful functional project which does much more than solve my initial problem um, a lot of the work wasn't even done by me it was done by other people which is really valuable for me uh, so when choosing a project which you might want to contribute to um, there's a few factors to to take into account first of all is um, what opportunities does it afford you so if you've got certain skills which you want to contribute which you want to learn maybe um, or you know a particular area of you know, language which you want to learn um, you might look at you know what language is that project written in what um, skills are they looking for um, in terms of development in terms of translation project management that sort of thing um, and also in terms of the levels of commitment which you can give is there, do you have enough time available at the moment that you can commit enough time to that project that um, you will get what you need out of it? Um, also, the one important thing to, uh, to think about is 
is it something you're interested in? If you're going to be contributing to a piece of software which you don't use, then you're not really solving a problem that you're having. So you might not be getting much out of it, which may in the future lead to a lack of motivation. So it's really important that you pick a problem which you would like to solve, really. Uh, in his book, uh, Cathedral Bazaar, uh, Eric Raymond made the point that to solve an interesting problem, you need to find a problem that's interesting to you. Um, and often, certainly if you're engaged in education, there are various other reasons why you get involved in things. But I think it's really important if you're choosing a software project that it really is something that is one of your interests. Um, now that can be something that maybe is a little bit possibly surprising, things like uh, things that relate to your hobbies and interests, like music or sport or games. Um, any of these things is worth exploring in terms of contributing to open source software. And I think actually you're more likely to contribute something useful to something that really is a passion of yours, that really connects with your interests. Okay, uh, well there's a few different ways to think about it. First of all, first off, um, is to look at project hosting websites. So there's websites which are out there which are um, dedicated to hosting open source projects, which also might contain um, some of the things like the bug tracker and uh, the mailing list and things like that. Um, so some examples of these are Google Code, SourceForge, GitHub, things like that. So you could look for a project and you know very quickly get an idea of what the outstanding issues are that you might get involved with, try and find who's involved in them and things like that. Another route to go down is to look for uh, software foundations which host a lot of these projects. Um, so people like the Apache Software Foundation um, will have a list of their projects which you can get involved in. Um, Mozilla have a very good tool for um, finding out you know, what you're interested in contributing and which projects they have which match those, uh, those requirements. Um, and so you can, yeah, often these foundations, if you look on their websites, will have ways of you getting involved. Um, so when you when you look at the project, another thing to, to think about is um, who's involved in the project. Um, are they going to be people that you can work with? So you want to look at the, the communication channels they use, see what kind of discussion they had. Um, you know, um, is the tone right to uh, to the kind of tone that you're used to, that you can work with, that you can fit into? Um, do you understand um, how the discussions are going, how the decisions are made, that sort of thing? Another thing to consider is the, the cultural fit. Is the kind of community around the project one that you feel comfortable working with? So one way of looking at it is, um, is the kind of the way the project presents itself on the web, something you're comfortable with. Is it, is its image it projects something that you think, yeah, I'd really like to be part of this. Um, when you look at the kind of communication patterns of that community, is that something that you, you know, makes you feel like you want to contribute, or is it something that kind of like pretty much makes you want to run away? Um, but these are kind of personal things you have to decide when you look at it as to whether it's something that fits you. Although a project can be open source, that doesn't necessarily mean it's open for contribution. I think it's really important that you have to check out first what the kind of policies of the project are. Do they, do they actually afford people getting involved? So for example, um, there are projects out there that are open source but which are only produced by a single company and all the developers are really kind of people who work for that one company. Uh, you can often tell this just by exploring the website for a project. So, is there, does it invite you to get involved? Is there a place to go to to find out information about how you contribute? And that's often one of the first things you look for. Um, if they've got a, an information page for contributions, then that should point you at things like where does the source code live? Where is the issue and bug tracker? Uh, wh which mailing list do you need to join if you want to be a developer, for example, or contribute in some other way? If these things are missing, then it might indicate that this is not the sort of project that's actively seeking contributions. As well as being available to contribute to, um, the other thing to look at is, is the project still active? Because if you contribute to a, a project that's mostly kind of like dead or that no one's looking after anymore, um, it's not going to be much help to you because you know, there may be no one there who can apply a patch you supply, there may be no one who can answer your questions. 
So another thing to track is how active is that project in terms of its community? Are people um, you know, saying things on its mailing lists or on its forums on its website? Um, does it have a good kind of history of contributions? Now there are tools you can use, there's a site called Olo that you can go to and put in uh, the name of a project and you can track things like how many contributions it's had. You can show little graphs on there showing you know, things like uh, year on year, have there been more and more contributions, how many people are engaged in that. And that's quite a good indication you can use for how active a project is. Generally speaking, the more active a project is, the more people there are out there who can answer any queries you, you have and help get started. In fact, the largest projects have often people whose role is to help with managing the community and to helping onboard new contributors. Conversely, very small projects may you know, actually spend more effort trying to get you involved because clearly you can make a much bigger contribution the smaller the project is. Five things to look for in an open source project. The bug tracker, mailing lists, a roadmap, version control system, and governance. A bug tracker, it's also something like an issue tracker, is really the workflow system of a project. It's where new issues are raised and where statuses of those issues is managed. So for example, someone reports a bug, they report in the bug tracker, they write a little report of what the problem is. If someone fixes it, they, you know, they put that down there, they change the status that it's been fixed. And you can use a bug tracker to track the health of a project, generally speaking. In a good, healthy project, there should be both be a large number of issues being reported and issues being actively closed. Uh, things to worry about is if there's a large number of bugs but nothing seems to happen to them, in which case the project may have you know, sort of become a bit stale, people have stopped fixing things. Or if there's no bugs, if there's nothing there, then maybe people just aren't using the project and aren't finding things wrong with it. For communicating, uh, projects have a number of different channels they, uh, they can use. The, one of the most common ones is actually a mailing list. Now, this is kind of like a bit of an old-fashioned way of communicating in some ways. I know a lot of people use things like web forums and social networks and so on these days, but often a very efficient way for managing open source projects is mailing lists, so using email to communicate. Um, now, some also use web forums and some use other kind of communication channels like IRC and other sort of chat and hangouts, that kind of thing. But the main thing you're looking for with projects is either a mailing list or a web forum. Yeah. Um, so what you sometimes find um, with when you're looking at forums and mailing lists is that different types of contributors to a project would um, prefer a different type of medium. So quite often developers um, tend to prefer mailing lists while users might prefer web forums. Um, generally speaking this is because you know, developers are used to looking at pages of text and, and email, a mail lists of pages of text, whereas users are used to looking at a user interface, which is what a web forum provides. Um, also recently there's been a rise in um, web-based Q&A sites, which sort of combine the best of both worlds. They're um, usually very easy to find on the search engine, uh, very well curated so that you can um, ask a question and get an answer without having to see a lot of off-topic discussion. Um, you can find these things on uh, sites like Stack Exchange. Most projects will use a version control system. Um, there are quite a few different ones out there. The ones you look for are things like Subversion, um, Git, uh, CVS. There are quite a few of these things out there. But they all basically behave in the same rough way, which is that it allows individual changes to software to be tracked, and also for it to be tracked back to who did it. So if you make a contribution to a project, you make it through the version control system and then your change is registered against your name. Now that has two benefits. One is that you can find out who's to blame if something goes wrong. Um, but also it means you can keep, have a good idea of who's working on the project and what their interests are and what things do they tend to work on, what things do they tend to fix. So a version control system is actually very handy in examining a project and understanding how it works. So when looking at version control systems, uh, there's two sort of major schools of thought as to how a version control system should work. So you'll find there's two varieties of systems which might be being used by a project and that the kind of system used uh, will affect the actual process of contribution. So um, one type of system is the centralised system. So um, CBS and Subversion are two fairly major 
um, centralized systems. What this means is that there'll be one central server where um, the code is stored and the whole revision history is stored. Um, a, U a developer will check out a working copy, do some changes and commit that their change back to the server. Generally speaking, in an open source project, um, only sort of uh, established trusted developers will have commit access to the central repository, which means that when you're contributing code to such a project, you'll probably um, create a patch, which is a file which contains just your changes, and then you'll either submit that to a mailing list or via an issue tracker, and it will then be applied to the central code repository by um, a developer who has commit access. So um, the second type is distributed version control system. So this is a system like Mercurial or Git, uh, where every developer has um, what's called a clone, a copy of the entire repository, which they use for development. So this will have all of the code and all of the history, uh, which means that they can do um, committing and developing on branches locally. Um, the way that this is then contributed back is um, through what's sometimes called a pull request, which is where they'll send um, a URL representing a particular set of changes in their copy of the repository, and this will then be merged into the upstream version of the repository by a developer who has access there. Okay. A roadmap is a document that sets out where the project's going, you know, what, what their intentions are. Sometimes it can talk about releases, sometimes it can talk about features or kind of target platforms. Not all projects have them. Uh, quite a few projects just kind of evolve depending on what their contributors, you know, where they wanted to go. But in some cases you can see from a roadmap maybe there's things there that appeal to you that maybe you know, link to your skills or interests. So it's a good place to look for that. So when you look at a project roadmap, what you might see is uh, a series of milestones, which could be uh, a date, could be an event, could be a version number. So it could be that you know someone's it's someone's birthday and they want to make sure that a new feature's in for their birthday, or it could be that it's you know, release one point oh and there's um, there's things which need to happen by then. So um, you'll then see that there are certain um, actions that are associated with each milestone. These could be linked to a bug tracker um, in order to actually you know, link the, the roadmap into the workflow. Uh, and so you might see that you know, by 1.0, this bit of um, quality assurance work needs to be done. These particular bugs need to be fixed. Um, and you know, in the next major version, these features are planned to be in there. So this gives you an idea you know, you might be looking at the um, at the software, and you might be thinking, "Well, this isn't, you know, this doesn't suit my, my this doesn't solve my problem because it doesn't have these features." But the roadmap can show you, sort of looking into the future, what are they planning to add to the project. Some larger projects, um, in particular, will also have an explicit model of governance. This is just how the project works. So they may have, for example, a particular model for um, the roles that you take in a project or the responsibilities that you gain. Uh, there may be particular rules they have around intellectual property rights. Um, they may have particular processes they talk about or principles they have in communications and things like releases and that kind of thing. It's generally something you find in larger projects because they need these uh, government these rules and regulations and principles because they have a large number of uh, contributors and they're often from very different organisations and cultures. Uh, smaller projects often don't have an explicit governance model, and so you have to kind of determine it from the, the basically the, the interactions between the people involved. One of the kind of initial barriers that uh, new contributors can face is actually making that first step of actually talking to a project, like talking to that community. What do, what do you say? Where, where do you start? Um, one of the easiest places to start is to get the software, download it, follow the instructions on the website, follow the, the documentation, um, try and get it working for yourself. And if you come across any problems, then use that as the basis of your first message. So sign on to the mailing list or go to the web forum and just explain the problems you're having. And be very clear and be very polite. So you start with things like identifying, you've read the documentation, you followed it, but when you get to this step, this unexpected thing happens. And make sure you document things like, you know, this is a platform I'm using, or these are the steps I've taken. 
And that kind of establishes that you're kind of serious. You've tried something. You've looked at the instructions. Um, you're providing enough information for someone to answer. And that should be a hook then for people to respond to you and to try and help out. Because in most cases, you know, in your project, you want people using it and you want to help anyone who's, you know, kind of new, get started. You certainly don't want to just fail at that point and never use your software, their software again. So I think that's a, a reasonable place to start for a new message if you're getting, if you're very early on with the project. So when you're communicating with people in project, it's important to remember uh, that most of these people are volunteers. Um, and you know, there's only so much you can expect from a volunteer. Uh, you can't you know, demand that they respond to you. You can't demand that they fix a particular bug. Um, you've got to make them want to help you. So that means being polite, um, being helpful, thanking them once they've helped you, um, and generally fitting in well with the community. So if there is someone who's trolling and trying to wind people up and get a reaction, you know, don't get involved in that, just try and be as constructive as you can to the community. Okay. Right, so once you've, uh, you've got yourself signed up to the bug tracker, uh, it's really valuable to report bugs on there and report good quality bugs. What, what makes a bug good quality? Um, there's really three questions which you need to answer. There's um, what was I trying to do, what did I expect to happen, and what happened instead. And the key is to give as much detail as possible at each of those stages. So um, in uh, what you were trying to do, um, you'll say uh, what version of the software you were using, um, what uh, system you were running it on. You will give a, a sort of list of steps to reproduce the problem that you had. Um, then what did you expect to happen is, you know, usually uh, quite short because you're just describing the expected behaviour um, which might be something which you've seen happening before uh, or it might be something which you think should change but you just need to give as much detail you know, I expect to see this message or I expect to see my file look like this uh, and then what happened instead um, will be you know, a description of what happened uh, also crucially any error messages which were uh, which were shown because um, you know, the error messages are put in there by the developers to tell them what's going wrong. So it's really, really important that you send those messages back to them. Excellent. So uh, the process of making your first code contribution, first of all, starts with um, identifying the problem you've got to solve. Uh, now, um, this is a good way to do this is you know, find a bug um, with a piece of software um, or find something which you think you can improve. Then um, the first step is to go to uh, the mailing list or the forum and you know, make sure that you're not duplicate, you're not either you can change an expected behavior which isn't meant to be changed or you aren't duplicating someone else's work. So um, post a description of um, the issue you found and um, what you intend to do about it. Uh, and then what should happen is that one of the existing developers or members of the community will get back to you and say you know yes that's a you know that's a bug we could do having that fixed or they might say no leave that be that's supposed to happen for this reason hopefully they'll explain to you in as much detail as possible um, once that's happened then um, if you're sort of given the go ahead with this then the issue will be raised on the issue tracker and um, assigned to you um, you might also, depending on the size of the project, be assigned a mentor to work through it with you. Um, you'll then take your copy of the code, uh, make your change to it and um, produce a patch which you'll submit um, often through the issue tracker. Uh, this will then be tested by other developers, um, reviewed for coding style because often a lot of um, projects will have a set coding style. They expect code to be formatted in a certain way just to ensure that all the developers, you know, they see what they expect to see when they're looking through the code. It makes it a lot easier for everyone to contribute to the same code base. Um, once it's been tested and um, ensured that it meets these standards, then it will be um, integrated into the project's um, version control system and usually with um, a, an attribution to you as the person who wrote the code, uh, this would then generally stay in the in the code repository until the next release. Um, your first change is likely to be a fairly small one, so um, it's unlikely that there's going to be a new version released just for a small 
um, a small change, but then when the next next hardware software is packaged up for release, your change will be in the version which is distributed to everybody. It's always worth bearing in mind that although open source projects are software projects, software is not the whole of the project. And there are lots of other ways to contribute. And often these are you know, very much things that the project you know, likes to see happen. One of these is improvements to documentation. Uh, documentation can always be better with most projects. And often developers aren't necessarily the best people to you know, improve the documentation. If you can volunteer your services to make the documentation better, more accurate, more readable, that's something that is often you know, very, uh, you know, sort of something that projects really appreciate. Another aspect that is kind of a specialist area that isn't software is localization. Now, a lot of projects have a kind of a localization file somewhere where you can contribute translations of the software in different languages. And that, again, is something that, you know, is a specialist skill that not often the developers themselves may or may not have or may not have the time to do. If you can localize it into a different language, that's, again, as a really good contribution. Another role within uh, an open source project would be being a, um, a community person, really. So this can be um, a, a large projects or have um, often a role of community manager where they're, they're the person to oversee, um, especially where uh, a company is doing a lot of de development, being an interface between the developers and the broader community, which might be other developers, might be users, customers, etc. But to, to curate the community and um, ensure they're happy, ensure they're contributing. Um, but um, sort of a, a more grassroots level, um, these roles can involve um, just um, moderating mailing lists, moderating forums, um, taking minutes in, uh, in meetings, communicating announcements, running blogs, that sort of thing. So one common mantra of open development is the idea of release early, release often. Uh, what this means is that when you're releasing code, um, especially early on in a project, you don't need to worry about it being perfect or even, you know, um, bug free, even doing what you said it would do in the first place. As long as it's something which people can run um, and you know, get an idea of what, the, what it's going to look like, what it's going to do. Um, this is important because then you know people can can actually see that you're you're able to produce something workable that they can then contribute to. I think it's worth knowing that most projects are extremely welcoming of contributions of any form. Uh, they certainly don't have you don't have to be the best programmer or you know the best person at documentation. Often, many projects um, are based on lots and lots of incremental improvements, often very very small. And so there are lots of places where you can actually hook into a project, make a small improvement, and have that actually become part of the project. And some of those things where you can get involved can be quite minor. They don't require, you know, sort of very deep technical skill necessarily or deep understanding of the project. And I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of projects are very welcome contributions. So anyone can contribute to an open source project. Now, many of the skills that you need to learn for working with an open source project are actually exactly the same skills that you need for any major software project, closed source or open source. So, all the things you need to learn about for open source, which are things like issue tracking, things like communication, online using mail lists and so on, these are all things that are used in companies around the world for producing software. So, the investment you make in engagement with open source is something that directly translates into things like uh, employability within the industry as a whole.